The Muslim world and Islam has the fastest growing religion in the world when you include birth rates and conversion rates. Every day that goes by, more Muslims are coming into the world. One out of every four men, women, and child is a Muslim. There are so many Muslims who we would now call unengaged or Muslims who have not been exposed to the idea of who Christ is. Every day, Muslims are dying without the assurance of knowing Christ. These are people that Christ died for. Someone needs to tell them that there is a Savior who loves them very much. Each Frontiers team is tasked with seeing the gospel planted within social networks or within families. Recent studies indicate that Muslims are turning to Jesus in unprecedented numbers. We need to be out there inviting people to give their lives for this magnificent cause. Things that are happening in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in India, in North Africa. These are opportunities to minister the grace and love of Christ. Throughout history, Christians have not been effective in making disciples among Muslims. And that's partly because they haven't had enough training. One of the strengths of Frontiers is that we will provide and we do provide general training, but also specific training to the specific geographical part of the Muslim world that you're going to be going to. Now is the time for us to recruit more workers. Right now there are opportunities we have never had before and we may never have again. There is a window to which we must respond. I don't know, none of us know how long these windows are going to stay open. This is the right time for Christians to influence Muslims before the world influences them. The problem is not with the field. The problem is the laborers are few, and we're seeking to see the laborers increase among Muslim peoples. And that's why we say, it's too soon to celebrate. It's too soon to quit. I get weak in the knees every time I see this video because I can't believe that the Lord has included us in this greatest gospel enterprise in human history to take the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ beyond where Christianity dead ends to where, as Matt said, it's the hardest places left. And as my colleague Jeff said in the video, every day, Muslims are dying without the assurance of knowing Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that's why Frontiers exists. That's why a myriad of different agencies and large denominations and churches who have a priority on making Jesus known among Muslim peoples and a myriad of other denominations that are beyond our borders are working in these communities where Jesus is finally being known after centuries of Islam. And I am privileged to say that I've been a part of Frontiers for 15 years, working with churches to help them send their folks to the Muslim world to catalyze, to begin church planning movements. Let me give you one example. A local Phoenix church, the missions pastor just felt called with his wife to go to start planting churches in North Africa. Not only David and Debbie, not their real names, but they invited a couple from their small group too in hopes that others from their church would join them. David sat down in this North African city at a cafe, learning language, that's what you do when you hit the ground, you learn language real hard for two years. And he's sitting at a cafe at a table, going through the nouns and the verbs of his Arabic dialect, and he notices a man in the distance staring at him. And this goes on for several minutes, and he can feel the weight of this gentleman's eyes. The man sits down across the way from him in the cafe. Then after a while, he comes closer and sits down again at a closer table, and David re reasons with himself, you know, this is just the local police, they have files on everybody in town who's not a local. Then the guy gets up and pulls the empty chair where David is, next to David at his table, sits down, and in his broken English says, you were in my dream last night, and you're supposed to tell me about your king. 
We want more David and Debbies. The Lord is preparing Muslims for the truth. And we're looking for more David and Debbies and teammates like theirs to go to catalyze church planning movements. I just want to share a few things about Frontiers and a little bit about myself, and then I'm going to start you on my journey. But uh, Frontiers started about 35 years ago with the innovative idea that it will be Muslim-focused, it'll be about church planting only, and also it will be the 1,200 members who are field workers serving on 225 teams the leaders of those teams will be the bosses of the organization, not bureaucrats in Phoenix, where Frontiers is headquartered, or in London, where our international headquarters is, is located, but the real bosses of the organization, those closest to the activity of church planning, will be the leaders of the organization making policy. Very, very cool. We work in about 45 Muslim countries, as well as India, which is obviously primarily Hindu, but the third largest Muslim populated country in the world. We work in those 45 countries doing church planting. And my wife and I have a few connections with Gross Point. Uh, Matt shared that we we're going to celebrate 30 years of marriage next month. In fact, we were married just down the road at Gross Point Memorial Church. And my in-laws spent uh, 30 years on Oxford and Gross Point Woods before my mother-in-law moved over to Kalamazoo and uh, right after her husband died. And my uh, Uncle Russ and Aunt Dopey lived on Bedford Road in Gross Point Park. Yes, Dopey. My legend has it my dad couldn't say the word Dorothea, so out came Dopey. So imagine Aunt Dopey, a very stately, well-put-together woman in a store in my two brothers and me scheming and yell out, Dopey, we're over here. And can you imagine this beautiful woman being called Dopey and all the heads just turn in the store? And uh, so we would have fun with that. And to make matters worse, her husband called her Butch. So poor Dopey got it from both sides. But uh, when I, I was um, young, I just started having all these questions. And I want to start you on this journey of mine and, and describe for you an unprecedented personal discovery I made along the way and the implications. I'm going to really unpack the implications of that discovery. But when I was a young kid, I remember in elementary school quite vividly, I asked my mom pretty philosophical questions on where does life come from? Not the, you know, we're not where babies come from, but questions like humanity. Is this all there is? Where's humanity's destiny? Where are we going as a human race? Is there an end to all things? And not only that, my mom, God bless her, she encouraged me to read the Bible. And not only that, I decided to type the Bible. Why not? I had summer vacation. And kids, that is a 1970s combination printer keyboard. It weighs about 3,000 pounds, and it probably weighs as much as your parents' Chevy Impala. But I probably got as far as Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, and some kids in the neighborhood want to play baseball, and that was the end of my career typing the Bible. But it left an impression on me, those early questions. And thankfully, my mom, in her, you know, gratefulness and encouragement really found rich soil in my heart. I'm liking it to the parable of the sower in, verse, in chapter 13 of Matthew. Thankfully, it, that seed she planted found some rich soil. And I came to some measure of faith in high school. And uh, it wasn't to a lack of my interest, but I was ne never followed up. I remember walking out of that Bible study, that high school Bible study, with the idea of, what do we do now? My, my friends who came to the Bible study, we had some measure of, 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 
uh, coming to faith, and nobody followed us up with discipleship. But I'm grateful for a young man at my years at Western who connected with me and discipled me. Kevin basically said, let's imitate Jesus together. Let's walk in obedience together as we go through the scriptures. And I'll always be indebted to his openness to disciple me. And another sphere of my life was evolving through my secondary education and my college years because by the time I had graduated from college, I had been to 17 foreign countries on three significant foreign trips. One of which I was in Greece as a foreign exchange student in high school. And so God was developing this idea to serve him in some global capacity and I didn't know what was going to happen with that. You know, I grew up in the Presbyterian Church and one summer after I had started at Comerica Bank in commercial lending, one of the former uh, missionaries in the church, now a member, took a group of us back to Pakistan where he lived for 20 years. O.A. Brown, Dr. O.A. Brown is there on your right. And here we are in a Pakistani village. And I thought the Lord was going to lead me to Pakistan. But he had other intentions for me. I was dating Lindy at the time and we got married. She said yes to my proposal and we thought we were both going to be ending up in Pakistan. But he led us to Comerica Bank office in Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> Dayton, Pakistan, I, I understand that. But it's amazing to think that God was taking those early inquiries of me, of mine, and leading me on a path to make those really solidify and understood my life. He introduced me to a pastor named Jim. Jim was the missions pastor of a large evangelical church in Dayton. And he challenged me. He discipled me and he challenged me by saying, think, step back and think of the Bible as one story. One story of God's redemptive plan for all the nations of the earth. And not only this, he knocked me over by Ask me just to focus on Matthew 24, 14. I'm sure by the time he told me and asked me to do that, I had read Matthew 24, 14 many times. Just covered it. Not really wanting to grasp or understanding what the intent of, the, of that message is in this verse. But let me give you some context for this verse. It's what is referred to as the Olivet Discourse. Matthew 24, 14 is in the Olivet Discourse where Jesus is explaining to his disciples what is going to tr transpire toward the end of the age. They're sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple in Jerusalem a few days before Jesus' crucifixion. And Jesus is going through some signs and some warnings of what is going to be happening in, in the future. Some pretty scary and crazy stuff, but also some glorious stuff of his return and the gathering of the saints. And you have it here. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. Now, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. And Nothing happened when I wrote, read that. So he asked me to read it out loud again. And again. And maybe the, on the fourth or the fifth time I read it out loud, it finally hit me. The significance of this verse. Before we can talk about the end or experience in it, there's going to be a gospel proclamation. Some degree of gospel proclamation and preaching within every people group of the earth. Before we can talk about the end, there'll be some degree of gospel proclamation within every people group before the end. And we all have these significant events in our life that we really count as first tier. Maybe it's your wedding, a birth of a child, uh, coming to Christ. My friends, understanding the significance of this is not quite in that tier, but it's, it's very close. 
So the remaining part before we have communion, I just want to unpack this verse a little bit and understand the significance with the end in mind, keeping the end in mind. Now, as we go through this verse, I want you to be asking yourself some questions. Why should this message be important to us? What relevance does it have in sending workers, laborers of the gospel to the Muslim world have for our lives and to God? And if this message has any degree of relevance, then what are some new additions we can take and make in our own lives to bring the hope of Jesus Christ to hundreds and millions of Muslims? 1.6 billion Muslims on the face of the earth. And for your bulletin answer, Patrick Johnstone in the video mentioned this. Well, his comment is mentioned. Only 14% uh, of Muslims have met a follower of Christ. Flip that over, 86% of Muslims have not met a follower of Christ based on his research. That's pretty significant. So I want you to keep those in mind. But before we unpack this a little bit, I want to just focus in on what's on the other side of the end. And God gives us some dramatic portraits and glimpses of, of what we have to come. And I, I chose two. I, you can just, there's tons we could choose from, but these are really impressive to me. And I heard a lot, this is from Revelation 21, 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them. And they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And then from Isaiah on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow death forever. For, forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. These are tremendous pictures of what is in store for us of the invisible God finally being the visible God, being in his presence, face to face with God. And I'm telling you, a personal testimony of mine, the more I understand Islam, the religion of Muslim people, the more I fall in love with Jesus. Because in their Islamic theology, God is so far removed from them in heaven and even in this life. And I'm I cry in my heart for Muslims not to have a God, a God who would serve us like this, prepare us food. I mean, that just blows my mind. We have a God who loves us and cares for us that much. So I want you to see what's on the other side of the, the end before we unpack uh, some of the strategies God wants to help us understand. Of, of preaching to all the ethne. I just want to unpack a couple of uh, definitions in the few remaining minutes before communion. What does it mean if I go back to uh, Matthew 24, 14, 24, 14, preach to all nations? We've got to understand the word nations. It appears, the word appears about 700 times in the Old and New Testament. And, and it doesn't mean... Uh, political entities with globally recognized borders, the 212 nations that are recognized in, in the, on the earth. No. These are distinct people groups. Nation comes from the word ethnos, the Greek word ethnos, if you can believe that, where we get the word ethnic. And some of the common traits are listed there, language, history, and we know this from Revelation 7, 9, and 5, 9, because... Before the throne, there'll be uh, peoples from all tribes, tongue, nations before the throne. And so these are some of the traits of the people groups on the, uh, of defining what a people group is or a, a nation. And rules such as marriage strongly define what a people group is for us. Well, let's not only talk about uh, context, but also definitions of, of numbers of progress. We know that there are 12,000. That's a little um, 
up in the air of exactly how many people groups exist. I've seen a range from 8,000 to 16,000, with 13 to 12, 12 to 13,000 is the most prevalent. So we'll just say today that there's 12,000 people groups. How many have been reached? 5,000 have been reached for the gospel, meaning that there is a significant gospel presence of church planning in that people group where they don't need help from the outside. Meaning, for instance, my people group in the United States, there's, there's let's say, uh, uh, 25 churches for every one McDonald's, okay? So we don't need help from an outside group, okay? Even though Bra Brazilians are sending their fieldwork missionaries to the United States to minister, we really, we can do this on our own. We should be doing this on our own. But that's a reached people group. Uh, and an unreached people group is this. They don't have the strength and the mass to reach their own people. 2% or less of the people are evangelical believers. Defining unreached, less than 2% of the people are evangelical. So they need help from the outside. They're unreached. So there's 7,000 of those on the face of the earth. Unengaged is a subset of unreached. There is no gospel presence within those peoples. I have a list right here of 1,037 people groups, Muslim people groups, representing over 10 million people, Muslims, and they don't have any gospel presence among their people group. And this is one of the reasons why frontiers exist. To get churches in the United States and Canada and Hong Kong and Philippines and Europe and Costa Rica and South Africa and through the sub-Saharan parts of Africa to move their people to parts of Asian Africa where this will come to zero. We're hoping by the year 2025 that it will occur. So pray for us. I'd like to read one story before I really unpack the vision, we talked about the vision already. I want to talk about the strategy leading up to the Matthew 24, which is an outcome of God's strategy. And this is from one of my European friend, colleagues. I just, he gave me this story last uh, month when we were together. And it's his story, Gerhard and Heidi, not the real names. An African girl of 10 years old was the daughter of a Muslim leader and the patriarch of his clan. They lived in a Muslim country in Africa. The girl had a dream. In the dream, the girl was handed a holy book that was given to her by a woman with white skin. This dream made her feel extremely happy and special. The impression that was left by the woman was that the book was important. In the morning, this girl shared the dream with her father. Her father became very concerned. The girl's father took her to the imam, the leader of the local mosque. The father made the girl repeat the dream to the imam and how the dream made her feel. feel. The imam was shocked and told her and her father that she is cursed. He said one day she will follow Jesus. The girl never forgot the dream. How the dream, made, how the dream in the book made her feel and the woman in her dream. Fast forward 20 years. Gerhard and Heidi and their two small children arrive in this African country and in the girl's town. The girl is now 30 years old. The woman saw Heidi walking down the street in her town. The woman recognized Heidi as the woman in her dream 20 years ago. The woman yelled to Heidi, Hey, white woman, what took you so long? Do you have the book? <sighs> This woman has been the impetus of, of starting churches among her people for the last 15 years. That's what God is doing. I want to just, in the few minutes remaining, I want to talk about God's strategy of how this is going to be done. I've, again, just like in his vision of keeping the end in mind and seeing what's on the other side of the end, we could be here all day talking about God's strategy. I really have just a couple that we're going to have 
to be able to look at. And that's the cornerstone verse of the Great Commission, the context of which it's right before Jesus' ascension, uh, a couple weeks after his uh, resurrection, and he's nailing down some important aspects of what he wants his disciples to carry forth to the nations, to the peoples of the earth. And this message is for us as well. And the capstone here is all authority. I'm going to highlight all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And certainly, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Again, all authority. And he will be with us to the very end of the age. So he's standing with his disciples. And you know he's trying to remind them. Remember when we went to the southeastern shore of the Sea of Galilee and we healed the demoniac, the person who was filled with those spirits? I want you to heal him. Just like I did, I want you to do that. Remember I raised Lazarus from the dead? I want you to do that. Remember when we healed the centurion, the Roman centurion's slave, soldier? I want you to do that. Remember we, when we healed that child that was not a Jew? I want you to do that. And on and on. Remember when I told you to follow me? I want you to do that with others. So those are the cornerstone. Uh, this is the cornerstone, in my opinion, of God's strategy for us, the church. Uh, I'm probably um, going a little overboard, but I love it when, I, when these two, two verses come together. And it talks about the harvest is plentiful. And when we ask the God of the harvest, it's not a casual ask. It's knocking on the throne room of heaven, imploring God for the sake of his son Jesus Christ to send forth harvesters, laborers into the harvest. And because as I've kind of conveyed already, Muslims are waiting. They're, they are really encouraged by what God is doing in their lives and they need to be discipled. As in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, God wants us to disciple. And if, I don't have time to unpack it, but I really encourage you to look at John 4, 35 and in the context of that, how Jesus is really encouraging his disciples to go beyond the Jewish people to the Samaritans in this case, enemies of the Jews, to disciple them. We often think that the gospel and the Great Commission began at Jesus' ascension, but no. Quite earnestly, it begins in Genesis chapter 12 when God told Abraham to go to uh, Canaan, go cross-cultural, Go from southern Iraq with how prosperous you are, Abraham. Take your family and go to a land I will show you. Similar to what Dave is going to be doing. Real quick, we have some speed bumps. I just want to highlight in that the amount of missionaries being sent out to places, not just Muslim places, but to unreached places is, dw is dwindling. And we can't, uh, we, we, we need to see a turnaround. That picture right there is obviously uh, in red where the most uh, underserved peoples are located. We see Chad, we see Sudan, we see India, we see uh, places like Vietnam and into uh, uh, Laos over on the right side. But these are the hardest places. But we're seeing incredible movements of God in the, in the last 15 years. And this is so outdated already. This chart is about two years old. And we are seeing movements beyond 100 right now within the Muslim world. Meaning that more than 1,000 Muslims have formed within the last, or come to faith in the last uh, few years. 
and have gathered in churches. That is way outdated. I just returned from Germany where we had an international conference of maybe 1,200 uh, workers from the field. And uh, they, it is just beyond comprehension what's happening. They have people movements falling through their hands because they don't have enough workers to help them disciple the Muslims who want information. They are even giving thanks for the Syrian civil war because without that civil war, they would not have been introduced to Jesus Christ in Turkey or in Lebanon or Jordan where our workers and other workers are waiting for them. Unbelievable. Highlights of Africa. Of these are Muslim sheikhs and imams and just regular people coming, being uh, baptized. This is in India where one of our teams is baptizing uh, Muslim believers in the Ganges River and other places. Quick action steps, please, prayer. I listed some, uh, of, uh, listed some of these options and ideas for you in uh, the bulletin. Prayer is the fuel that's uh, empowering the Holy Spirit to transform communities, getting our workers ready. And I am grateful, Matt, for you sharing to pray for those who are in need in your congregation, those who are grieving, those who are suffering, those who uh, are going through difficult straits. Please be in prayer to raise up uh, labors for the harvest. These are great opportunities for you to, uh, for prayer. And real quick, I just want to close out. Uh, as you think about these questions, just my people. My people... I can trace my Sloan to George Thomas Sloan, my lineage, to 1756. I can, my mother's side of the family, we can trace her lineage back, her family line back to 1600s to southern England. Sloan to I Ireland, uh, Chapin to southern England. St. Patrick was from southern England. He was, he went to Ireland because based on a vision, but he thought from God, to go uh, bless the Irish people. Somebody had come from Roman territory to my people in southern England, who then my people, my mom's side of the family's line, took it to Ireland in maybe 400 A.D. Then the Irish took the gospel to what is now Scotland, who are alleged to have been practicing cannibalism. I'm sure the Scots didn't receive it the first time. There was a lot of martyrdom on the side of the Irish people, my people, who took it, the word of God to the uh, Scots. So you see that it has never been easy, but now, friends, it's the Muslims' turn to receive the gospel. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And that's why I love the guy. He has a passion for those that need to hear about Jesus. And as your pastor, here's, here's my concern. You sit there, we sit here, and there's part of this that, that I know, because I've, I've, I've sit in the pews where it's like, you, your, your back tightens up. It's like, I don't know about this. Muslim people? I'm comfortable here. And if we as a people don't catch a vision for people that don't know Jesus here and around the world, then, then I worry about us. Um, it very well could be that what Jeff has spoken to you today will be the impetus of you maybe leaving and going and being part of, involved in a ministry with Muslim people. But even if it may be something where you look and you say, I haven't shared my faith with anybody. All I know is, um, I, I love John Piper's book, Don't Waste Your Life. I think everyone should read it because it is real easy in America to waste your life looking after and, and just chasing the American dream and not caring about un reached people groups 
You know, we say, oh, that's for people like Jeff. You know, you, you go do that. But maybe God's called you and I to be part of this in some way. We're going to partake of the Lord's table. And um, as we partake of the Lord's table, it is always a good reminder to evaluate ourselves. The, the scripture says, examine yourself whether you are in the faith. As we partake of the Lord's table, it, it's just that. We are we're going to remind ourselves. And in light of what... In, in light of what Jeff has just spoken, here, here's what I want us to look at. Do you care? Do you care for people that are lost? I mean, do you really care? That's something between you and the Lord. But, but my prayer is, is as we evaluate our hearts that, that we would be honest before the Lord. If you're here today and a visitor and you know Jesus as your Savior, you are welcome to this table. It's a table that we recognize the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you call yourself a Christian and you're living in sin and, and you don't care about anything, you don't care about the lost, then the scripture gives a warning about that, not to partake of the Lord's body and, and, and blood in an unworthy manner. But rather, let's just confess and, and clear things before the Lord. But we, we desperately need to make sure that, that, that we are surrendered to him. So as we go to the Lord, um, let me just invite you to bow your heads and we're going to pray and then you can examine your hearts and the servers can come forward. Father, I come before you. Lord, I do pray that we would look at what Jeff has just said, not for us, not, not just that like, well, it's, it's, how do I feel? The issue is what have you called us to do? So I pray that you would move 